So hello to everybody. Good, ev good evening. Um, yeah, I will run you through a picture show more or less. Um, I have uh, roughly an hour or a little less, I think. Um, okay, this is a studio uh, in the harbor of Düsseldorf, 70, 80 people. Um, we are open, normally we open offices where we build big buildings, but we also close them right after that. Um, and um, it's an interdisciplinary uh, group of people uh, with engineers, with model makers, with uh, architects and interior designers and many more. When I do a lecture in America, I, I, I've been normally asked about the Google project, which uh, we have been selected for one and a half year ago to build the most healthy building for them. Uh, I'm officially not allowed to talk about that, not even show a picture. What I can tell you is um, that it's definitely not a high rise. Um, why I am in love with high rises? Uh, I think we need them. That's a simple uh, fact. And uh, there's a reason for that. And I will introduce you to some of our thoughts about uh, why we need them and what is the driving force behind our skyscraper projects. This is a beautiful picture and a beautiful kind of architecture. And it was done without architects. And I think that architects and architecture are a little bit like overestimated. Um, and architects tend to overestimate the, the role of the architect in the world of today. Because even today, I think 99% or 95% maybe of the architecture is architecture without architect. Um, this is also architecture without architect. This is in uh, a high rise architecture without architects, a clam. Uh, architecture, which is, which is very interesting to look at many, many aspects. Um, but, but one aspect what interests me most today is that it is about a very high density architecture. It shadows itself, has a very intelligent uh, air conditioning, if you like, or, or, or like ventilation system. Uh, it is a very, very good example to look at and do a deep look into the strategies and technologies that have been developed by these people without any architect or engineer. Um, the world is growing. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's still growing. M many people think it's not growing, but, but it's still growing to 9 or whatever, 10 billion people once. And then um, there are already cities like um, between Shenzhou and, 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 and Hong Kong where maybe one and a half 150 million or something, 120 million people live in a, a continuous kind of city. Um, so how could you go, how could you avoid building with skyscrapers? Not possible, right? Um, and then uh, this, the movement from the land into the city is still a growing thing. So um, there, are, there has been, in history, there has been a lot of moves of people around the world, but the one big one we have today is the one into the city. Um, and what is interesting is that um, even so that less than 20% of the people are living in the 40 biggest regions of the world, I think 60 to 70% of the gross income, uh, the economic production is getting out of these kind of regions. So the importance of the, of, of the success of the city, of the, of the, of the quality of the city is essential for the success and surviving on Earth. Um, Los Angeles, for example, is, is, is definitely not the role model for a city, um, not, not in city planning terms. Uh, it has grown between 97, uh, 75 and, and, and 90 uh, by, by, what is that exactly, 45%. Um, but it triples its surface. So, so, so what you see here, this is not, this is not the future. Um, it's it's def definitely not possible to, to set that as a role model for future development. And then uh, it happens today more like um, in the developed countries, in the developing countries, the emerging countries. Uh, so we will see this kind of uh, increasing infrastructure uh, and, 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 and kind of illness 
which, which extends uh, uh, transportation costs, uh, energy uh, consumption, and, 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 and spending resources of land into that kind of infrastructure. We will see that in these uh, upcoming emerging countries even more. This is a very, uh, a very interesting diagram where you can see that if you compare, for example, Tokyo, which is one of the largest cities of the world and one of the most safe cities in the world. It's a, for me, it's a role model because you can see it's not unsafe to have a city in that scale. Um, it's, it's a matter of cultural aspects, a matter of behavior, of, uh, of policy, and many, many, many other things um, if a city like Tokyo works or not. But uh, Tokyo has roughly four times the density of New York. New York is not supposed to be an undense city, right? Uh, and, and, and it spends like 25, just 25% 25 of the energy of New York. So, so I think if you compare then New York to Los Angeles, you will have even the same difference between uh, these two cities in one country. What you see here is there's a lot of room for density. There's a lot of, a lot of room for good architecture, good high-rise architecture. This is where the growth will happen mainly Africa, South America, and Far East. And, um, and that is, was once the beginning of uh, the career of the office. Uh, it was actually the first building we ever built. Um, the client didn't know that uh, it was the first building. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and it, was, uh, it um, was delivered like uh, nearly 20 years ago, like uh, 96, I think. Um, it's the RWE building. I won't go into detail. It's a building that had already a double skin facade and it has uh, a nearly full natural ventilation. Because the client wanted to get sure, be sure, um, we, made, we, we made sure that there's an, a kind of uh, mechanical ventilation at the same time that we opened the window. This is double in a way. Uh, so so, so we, you don't need that really. But in these days, we were asked questions about how a double skin works and we couldn't answer them uh, properly because we didn't have built one before. Um, so that is 60, had then 60% less energy uh, uh, spending than, our, than, than a normal building at that age. This is a building we built for, uh, for Heinz, an American developer, as you know, and, and it was a t tough job in a way, I mean a very interesting client, uh, tough job because uh, they really calculated every Single square meter, or even, uh, uh, even, 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 even less, and, and they were really a tough clients in respect of um, efficiency and, and things like that. They didn't like the double skin because it cost too much space. Uh, they didn't want to spend that 50, 60, 70 centimeters around the building additionally, so they looked for a kind of um, a ventilation that works with a single layer of facade, and we. We developed that kind of circular driven, mechanically driven, individually controlled uh, uh, window. And then uh, 50, 60, 70 percent of the year that's possible to ventilate the building through that openings. Depends a little bit about the wind speed and temperature and things like that. This is uh, a quite recent building we built in Dusseldorf, quite, quite a, a mid-rise building if you like. Um, what is interesting about that is it, it has again a double skin. The double skin is, uh, is, is here mainly for, for noise protection and to make the sun uh, shading system more, more, more efficient. Um, but it has 27% uh, of the year. It might be not possible to properly ventilate the building because uh, the temperature is too high or too low or, or the wind speed is too high, but normally you can open the window whenever you like. We did the, the recent years some um, residential building in the harbor of uh, Hamburg, for example, just to make sure that you know a little bit about the variations in our work. We, we delivered a building in, in Osaka uh, in Japan where the humidity and, and the temperature is, uh, is even higher than in New York in the summer. Um, and it was possible to do a double skin here as well. Uh, with 50% ventilation in the year. The other 50% you have to have a tight building because of the humidity and then you're going for, 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 a, for a hopefully very efficient kind of air conditioning. Uh, it has a podium. Uh, on top of the podium there is a, uh, is a office high rise. The podium includes as well shopping and retail and an opera house. A very curious decision, late decision 
uh, from, from the client. And we had to do this, that kind of transfer structure to make sure that that works. Um, and it gets an Caspi S-Class rating, which is the highest rating you can get in Japan so far. Uh, and as all of our buildings, we, we get a very high or the highest uh, certification uh, ratings in, in the Green Star system, the locals. Um, this is one Bly. Uh, we came to Australia like um, seven years ago. Um, and, and if you know Sydney, um, Sydney is, uh, is overall uh, a city that is comparable with Los Angeles from the point of density. But, uh, uh, but, but central Sydney is a very, very dense place. Uh, and it's supposed to be denser than London, Los Angeles, Mexico City. It's a very, very dense place because of that island on the rocks is, is, is limited. And the, and the pressure is extremely high to build more and, and more dense. And in the last years, uh, um, uh, the people have looked look for opportunities to build even residential there, but was, was, was not usual. Uh, but they try to do that. And I think from the point of sustainability, it's a very good idea to, to have a mixed city and to um, establish as well residential high rises into it. Uh, the position of the building is pretty much in the middle of the financial district, um, and it has the the privilege to uh, have a free view to the harbor because of the um, opposite buildings are listed buildings or are, they are in the perimeter zone of the higher buildings from the left and from the right. Um, and that makes it part of the postcard view of Sydney. We could have built 240 meters, uh, but then the, the floor plates would have been much smaller. So it was a decision together with the client uh, not to do so. Uh, but, but stay with 145 meters uh, and make sure that the efficiency of the building and the, um, and, and the scale of the floor plate are proper and, and economically and, uh, and, and, and uh, structurally uh, sensible. Um, if you look to the center of Sydney, it's more or less a rectangular grid. Um, for whatever reason, uh, one and a half century ago, they, 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 they decided to orientate a part of the city towards the governor house. Uh, some years later, they decided not to do that anymore, but that left us with the position of the building between these two grids, and that left far our place, which is the building in front of the, of the, of the, uh, the, the, the place in front of the building, uh, a triangular place. We come to, back to that later. It has a free view, as I mentioned, towards North Sydney and the Harbour Bridge, and there was many, many uh, was struggle to get a good uh, design for that place. Uh, finally, we decided to have an elliptical building turned into the view. And I will show you a little bit about the process, where, um, how we get there. This would have been the more rational and, and expected way to position the building. Uh, even the rectangular building was foreseen. Um, what we did is we turned um, the, excuse me, as it goes back, okay. Uh, what, what we did is uh, we, 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 we thought about how can we maximize the view. They are selling the view pretty much to the harbor, to Bondi, towards uh, uh, Darling Harbor, uh, towards uh, the coast. Um, and, and, and so we wondered about how can you, can you make sure that most of the people have the view, not how can you make the surface bigger. Because the bigger surface is in sustainability issues, not a view, not a, not a very good idea. Uh, so we wanted to have a compact building at the same time, make sure that most of the people have the view towards uh, the harbor. So we turned the building into the view, the, 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 bigger, side, the bigger side of the elliptical building into uh, the harbor view. And then if you look to the blue buildings around that, are the tall buildings around, we had to make sure that we have views between them. So there's one to Bondi, our national library. There's one back to the city. There's another one back to um, Mac, uh, Mac O'Donnell Street. And then, and then we had to position the course in that kind of building. And, and we tried to position the course without restricting any view and at the same time with, with blocking the views towards the nearest tall neighbors. So they have some, some of the buildings are just eight or 10 meters away. I think a, a film makes 
even better understand about how that is positioned. It's definitely the smaller brother between these big, big, big buildings. Oops. Um, that's pretty much the, the, the view you have if you come from the harbor, from the ferries, into the financial district. And that is how the building looks in his neighbor, neighbor surrounding. Um, there was another uh, decision we had to do about the height. Uh, we wanted to, to give back uh, most of the site that we use to the people of Sydney. Um, if you look too far, place, it, quite, it was a quite shadowed place uh, in the center of that district, but, and, 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 and in a way, very attractive position, but the conditions, the climate conditions, the microclimate conditions were not very good. So what we did is um, we thought about uh, maximizing the view and at the same time raising the building by nearly 20 meters. And, and so there was a free ground floor, uh, a raised ground floor uh, with a step in front of it. And that is a big chance in the center of Sydney because uh, with that raising, we get not just the public steps and, and, and an extension of our place, um, through to Bly Street, the same time we get for summer, where the sun is quite steep, uh, an overshadowed um, stair and, and an overshadowed public uh, steps, and the same time we get for winter when when the warm uh, the warm sun is welcome, uh, a deeper sun into uh, our building, and the same time a warm step to sit on, and the place is really overcrowded in summer. Uh, it's a very very good place to enjoy yourself and to have a rest. Um, and then Fire Place itself, uh, that triangular thing that is left over in the way between these two grid uh, systems, uh, we try to, to make it more rectangular, to extend it on our side. We gave away uh, the corner uh, to the public. And at the same time, we made sure that you can go all the way through the building. It's a public, accessible environment. It's not closed during the day. Um, and, and so uh, it's just, you know, just two restricted zones where the cores come down. And there's a very small security space where you can get into the cores and then up to the offices. The rest is absolutely completely public. Um, to go a little bit into detail, that are the stairs. And then there is a child care facility, and there is a, a restaurant uh, on top of the stairs into the atrium. There's a co coffee point on the other side to Bly Street, just to motivate the people more to use that entrance and, and to get through the building. Um, there is a green wall uh, behind it. The green wall um, is where the, the, the nearest neighbor is, uh, has to be covered. In the same time, we have a kind of bypass from one street to the other around the building, which is a public uh, pass. And this is the only security zone in the building. And there's a reception in the middle. And so that atrium is completely public. Um, it has a six star rating. It got the highest number of points ever uh, ever given in Australia. Um, and I would like to get a little bit into detail how that works, because I think if we need skyscrapers, if you need high rises, we have to make sure that we do the most advanced and most sophisticated and most civilized uh, kind of skyscrapers. And that is how we see the double skin on the regular floors. Um, the double skin, the, the, the advantages of a double skin normally is natural ventilation. It's possible to ventilate that building for 50% of the year, but there's another very serious, very significant uh, advantage of, of, of double skins that is a much better uh, sun shading because it's, it's outside the, the real building, the physical building, at the same time it's wind protected. And so it can be in place, in, it can be in function whenever it is needed, even if the wind pressure is pretty, pretty high. Um, so you get more daylight, you get the natural ventilation, you get a better sun shading. 
Um, then we have that resource of fresh air on the bank of the building. It's the atrium, a 145 meter high atrium, um, with, uh, which is natural ventilated because it's open from the ground floor. And as well, it's open from the back. Normally, it would be getting a little overheating to the top. Um, and what we do is we, uh, from, on the one hand, we have um, on the back some openings, some, some, some dubis, and then we get as well um, with, the, with, with, with the used air, which is relatively cool, into the atrium, and we cool it a little down, so at the end it is a little, the temperature, the raise is a little flatter than it would be normally. Um, the building, oh, excuse me, the building has uh, 40 plus percent less CO2 emissions than it would normally have. Um, that's not just about the double skin facade, that's also about uh, a tri-generation uh, plan, which is, um, which is run by biofuel um, and which provides electricity as well as cooling and heating. And then in addition to that, we have solar cooling on the roof. Um, we have as well a very uh, advanced water feature. Um, you know, Australia is very keen with this kind of issues because they have a water shortage, a serious water shortage. <laughs> Um, we get uh, we, what we call uh, uh, sewer mining. We, we, are, we are taking water out of the public sewer, uh, we clean it, and we need it in the building, use it in the building. Uh, we do a black water treatment. Uh, we, we get 75,000 liters a day back into, uh, back into the chillers, uh, into the cooling towers, um, and then as well for a toilet flash, uh, and then back into uh, the black water treatment. So we're saving one, roughly 100,000 liters a day. Um, the building, um, there are, I mean, it's always a question if that is just a technical issue to build a green building or is that an architectural issue? I think it's both. Um, the, the, the first and very important decisions, for example, are for the compactness of the building. And it is a simple fact, but, but it, it counts that it's 12% less surface than a comparable rectangular building with the same, with the same uh, floor plate. So it's a very compact form. Um, it has a very high efficiency, um, maybe unexpectedly. It has, uh, to be honest, to do as well with the kind of calculations they do in Australia, but 93% is, is, a, is a remarkable uh, efficiency. Um, and then the double skin is not all around the building. The outer glass facade is going all around the building, but the inner one, the real physical facade, is going just around the real office uh, facilities, and it has a potential of 50% natural ventilation a year. Um, that has to do with humidity and temperature. Um, if you would follow that in detail, you would see that humidity and temperature is in close relation to each other, uh, and then that the spread allows us to do within the green field uh, the 50% of natural ventilation during the year. Um, I won't go into technical details about how that really works, just give you a rough idea that there is to avoid the overheating in the double skin, we have to get the air out of that uh, cavity and then in, back in, but we have to make sure that it's not the used air of the lower compartment. So we have this blade making sure that there's a mixture between the used air and the fresh air from outside. Um, and then some of the other advantages of a, of a building or of a construction like that, um, the double skin itself is a protection, excuse me, it's a protection against rain, wind, um, and it makes sure that you can have the, uh, the sun shading in place. Um, so you get, get rid of the, the solar gain, most of them. Um, the same time you can use that um, as, as, a, as, a, as a glare protection system. If you, when, we, when we made our research for the project, we, we visited some of the other uh, offices in Sydney. What is absolutely disappointing is they have a glass facade, uh, but during the day they close it completely for, with, with a glare system, like with a, with a, with a kind of uh, 
uh, shading or, or glare protection system, and they block it completely out. So they have the most wonderful view in the world, and at the same time, they have no view at all during the day. So we wanted to make sure that the glare problem, which is even bigger than the sun gain problem in uh, Australia, is going to be solved with the same system. So with that kind of double skin, we can use it, the, the, the solar shading system as a glare protection as well. And, and so um, it lowers the need for, for running down uh, the glare protection by 60%. Uh, and I think that makes, uh, that makes sense because uh, you're enjoying the view, you have the daylight, uh, you have the full transparency, and at the same time you have uh, a sun protection which is significantly better than uh, every kind of colored or mirrored or whatever glass. Um, so you have not just the daylight coming from outside, you have it also from the back of the building, and that is uh, a big advantage because our, our, our floor plate is lighted from both sides, from the atrium as well and from the outside. What you can see with that photograph as well is that a normal high-rise is a quite artistic place where you can see other people, uh, even if, 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 you, if you live together or work together with them for 10 years, you might n never see them if you just, uh, and, and if you see them maybe in the lobby or in the, in the lift, that is by, by incident, right? Um, but here, the whole tenant's floors over the full height of the building are completely open to to the atrium. So everybody knows each other, knows the environment where you are living and, and, and working in. And that is the, um, the central communication hub of the building. So it's a real community in that building, not just uh, people that, that does not know each other. What is that now? Oops. Does not like me at all. I don't need any help. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I need help, but not now. <laughs> Yeah, to give you an impression how that works and how that looks and how that feels. I think the film is again better. We adopted in a way uh, a building type that's coming from hotels and other facilities into the world of offices. Maybe that's the opportunity to say that the Prime Minister of Australia has decided to occupy three floors in the building for their Sydney offices. So, and then on top of that, to, to give, I mean, we, we, we have still some restricted areas on the ground floor, and to fulfill our promise to give back 100% of the site to the people of Sydney, we decided to have a, a roof terrace on top of the building for, let's say, 40% of the floor plate there. Uh, there's a convention or a conference center on top as well, and that has a very, very beautiful view towards the harbor and back to the building. Um, there's an interesting fact maybe for people who are interested in the economics of a building like that, development of a uh, building like that. We got back 10%, we got additional 10% GFA for design excellence. You can get that in Australia. Generally, it was the first high-rise where we got that um, in Sydney uh, because of winning an international competition and whatever. The, the, the council liked it, and they, they, they awarded us with that 10% extra. And then we got um, 4 to 5% extra because of every natural ventilated part of the building um, is not counted um, for the GFA. And that is another four to five percent of the building. All the um, all the facilities around the the atrium are not counting for the GFA. There's a lot of awards, um, and that is how it looks like. Um, that's not the opposite now, but it's a completely different brief. Um, uh, we are actually building a building in Singapore um, for two of the governmental funds, one Tamasek is a governmental fund of Singapore, and the other one is a governmental fund of uh, Malaysia, is, uh, is Kasana. Both have joined forces to do a very big development in, uh, in Singapore on reclaimed, on originally reclaimed land. Uh, it's a 450,000 square meter uh, above ground development mixed 
1,050 something uh, residential units um, and 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 um, for whatever two to three thousand people, and then thirty to thirty five thousand people working in the offices. Additionally, retail, uh, shopping, uh, restaurants, uh, schools, uh, um, uh, child cares, uh, uh, amenities, uh, fitness, and so on and so on. Everything you need. Um, there, there are two things about Singapore. One is um, if you if you look at the um, uh, uh, the way they develop the city. Um, one thing is uh, from special interest that they raised or, or extend the, the, the city by 8% by reclaiming land. And they will do that uh, uh, ongoing. So they will have 25% additional land, additional land from the whole state of Singapore uh, with, within the next years. Um, uh, if you were in Singapore, you know that the beach road is now whatever two kilometers or two and a half kilometers from the beach. So, 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 what we do here is is part of the extension of the financial district. On the left side, it's a uh, it's a huge complex. Um, and and if you look to the importance of mega cities, I think we are we, we try to work on a kind of role model for these kind of countries and cities and 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 special conditions. Um, again, it was a, was, was a search for the best form and, and how we can handle the brief. Uh, one thing was uh, clear from the beginning, we didn't want to have four skyscrapers. There could have been four single skyscrapers, that's it. No, no connection, no, no nothing. Uh, but we, we, we looked for something which is um, dedicated to Singapore. Um, Singapore is quite green. Singapore has um, the advantage of having a very good climate for growing plants. On the other hand, it's very, very humid. It's very, very hot. It's not the most comfortable place um, on Earth. Um, so what we have to make sure is that it's uh, as comfortable as possible. People enjoy, even in the climate of Singapore, these kind of, um, these kind of uh, uh, places. That's a place in the botanical garden. And it was um, quite convincing to the client to see that the size of that lawn there is pretty much the size of our inner court. So we can do something in the middle of our, uh, of our building, which is, which is dedicated to the lands to potential landscape of Singapore. So what we, um, so we suggested is uh, put, the four, put the four blocks together uh, to a theoretical one and then dig out a hole in the middle, uh, what we call the garden or the green heart, and then make sure that, that, that all the buildings around uh, are orientated towards that green heart and that it is a true resource of tranquility and, and, and a real green space. This is the final design. Um, but I get you back to some city planning issues. I mean, this is a grid. Um, but the CBD will be extended towards two directions in the future. Still, the building itself will be a very central position in that extension. The MIT system, which is the underground uh, train uh, subway system in Singapore, is passing the building by with, with um, three stations very, very near to it. Uh, this is the underground uh, pedestrian walkway system in, in Singapore, which is needed in a climate like that. Uh, which is very, very, uh, a, a very, very vital system. It's not, it's not, it's not a dark uh, passage, uh, and 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 it's. There are at least. I did something wrong again. You have to help me again. Out. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Don't know why I do wrong. Okay. There are eight points of access from our site to the underground pedestrian uh, network system. Um, and the building, the development is a connection between these two planned parks, the Marina Bay Square and the Linear Park as well. And then in the other direction, it is oriented towards the marina. That is a, the reason why it has a name, Marina One. Um, what is uh, what we call an activity generating means that the whole ground floor, not just first and second floor of the basement, but the ground floor, which is the main interest, is completely activated all around with shops and entrances and, 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 and things that are dedicated to the public, not with back, uh, back 
house uh, things with, 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 with loading docks or with car entries and, and things like that. So that gives you an idea how that looks like on the ground floor from the street level. There is on, on, on the other side of the building, there is the entrance to the residential units that are mainly two on the left and the right side, big lobbies towards each 500 residential units. Um, there are some of these connection points to the underground pedestrian walk walkway system. Um, so it's, it's extremely uh, woven into the urban existing or f future uh, uh, fabric of the city and the network of the city. Um, the, the lobbies on the first floor um, so, so that we get a separation between the completely open public ground floor and the more secure uh, first floor lobbies. Um, and then on top of the podium building, we have, again, uh, a garden level. We are on top of all these podium floor plates, uh, a public garden is situated um, with a restaurant, with, 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 uh, with terraces, completely open. You can enter it by elevators and escalators. And um, you see the, what we call the sky garden, which is, a, in fact, a garden on top of the of the podium level. And there's another garden level on top of the, uh, uh, the transfer floors and the plant rooms in the middle of the buildings. And then there is one which is not accessible, but there is a garden on top of the, of the roof of the building. Um, and then there are the offices on the left side here. It's quite rational floor plays, which is interesting is that we will provide three uh, skybridge floors with uh, 10,000 square meter each. Uh, column free, uh, which is a special requirement from, from Tamasek, from the, from the uh, governmental fund of Singapore, because they wanted to have their offices there. And the requirement was that they wanted to sit in the middle of that uh, office floor and, and just have a view uh, above all these uh, people working there. Um, and then there's residential, on the other hand. Um, the residential in Singapore are economically uh, the, the if you, if you like, the most important part of the project, because selling the residential makes up, uh, uh, developments like that uh, possible. There are residential units towards the court and towards the streets. Um, that's the one facade, and there's the other facade. Um, they have uh, uh, terraces and balconies all around. But what is even more um, interesting is that the um, there is a requirement uh, that we fulfill um, to, 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 to have the potential ventilation of every single room in a residential unit by natural ventilation by openable windows. Still, they have an air conditioning, but they like to switch it off during the night and use uh, the relatively cooler, still warm, but relatively cooler air to ventilate the place. Um, is it possible to naturally ventilate a building like that? Uh, not really, um, because the humidity is too high. You see the, the line which is, which is showing um, the temperature and the relation to the potential natural ventilation. Uh, during the night, it is partly possible, as you see. During the day, which are the hotter temperatures, the, 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 the peak of the, the red uh, uh, columns, uh, it's not possible. And then, additional to that, we have a humidity, a serious humidity problem. Um, so natural ventilation is not, uh, not the real idea for a place like that. Um, it has been done before, uh, and we do it as well as an, as an extra for the night. But it's not, it's not what is the basis of the design for the, res for the, for the office and, and for the retailers. Um, there's another very interesting thing what you can do in Singapore. If you, if you, if you go around there, you're always looking for a breeze. Um, if you can sit somewhere on the water and, and you get some, some, some little wind, that makes it quite comfortable, even if it is quite humid. And so what we did is we, we made, a, made a research about how we can um, establish a situation where wind is better. Uh, a breeze is, 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 is better used than, than, than normally. And we have a main wind direction coming from the marina parallel to, parallel to the sea. Um, and because we have these four openings, especially the two in that direction helps us getting the wind into the court. Um, and then there is 
uh, an, another effect by heating the facade, we will get a uh, significant difference in temperature between the lower and the, and the upper parts of the facade. And then this kind of air movement sucks a little cold air into, uh, into the courtyard, which is then a resource of relatively cooler air. And what is even more important, that the air moves through the, through, through the court. And then there is, additionally to that, to that uh, main direction, we, we helped it by, op uh, by openings in the residential oops, high rise. Um, and these openings are all over, and they make sure that with the corridors and with the common corridors, and as well with openings in every single um, residential unit and every single room, a real kind of air movement through the whole um, development is, is, is going to happen. So that is how it looks like um, to, towards the street. It is hoped to be a resource of tranquility and, and, and a little relaxation in a, in, a, in a city like Singapore, where it is at least as vital as in New York. Um, And it gets a green mark platinum rating in Singapore, and that is equivalent to uh, the, 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 the lead platinum that we, which we are going to have uh, as well. I think that must be the end of it. Thank you very much. What I'm saying is that um, what's the total thickness of that? Um? It depends a little. With the RWE, we start with one meter gross, and that is 50 to 60 centimeters net between the columns and between the, the profiles. Um, Osaka, for example, is much less. Like, like uh, the, the, the clear um, uh, space in between might be like 15 to 20 centimeters just. Uh, in, uh, in Australia, it's a little more like 50 free, a uh, 50 clear. Um, so it depends a little bit what you want to do with that. If you if you gonna go through the cavity for cleaning, you need at least 50, 60 uh, clear. If it uh, is possible, like in Osaka, to open every window through the interior, no problem. Then you can restrict that to whatever 30 centimeters, 20 centimeters. Thank you. I think it's wonderful that you're allowing um, natural outside air, especially in the residential area. Um, I have a particular concern as I go around and travel all over. So many residential buildings that are being put up in recent years have no ability for the windows to open, and then in many cases, it's a very small opening. And I wonder if you could comment on that, because today we do know that the interior air in most buildings is more toxic in the outside air, and therefore having large windows that can open um, would be preferable. So I'm just wondering why architects are choosing to do this in residential towers. If the architect chooses it, I mean, I, I can't understand architects choosing that. Uh, but <laughs> it's happening maybe as a requirement. But, but I would say there are, if, if you look to, to vernacular architecture, uh, what I would call architecture without architects, you will see all over the world solutions without air conditioning. So there is a way. It might be better in a place like Houston, for example, or Singapore to use air conditioning for parts of the year, for parts of the day. But still, I think that openable or operable windows are, are the only solution that is human-like. Yeah. Everybody, I mean, if you, if you go into a hotel room, what do you do first? You, you go to the window and try to open it, right? <laughs> or, or if you look for a new flat or whatever, what do you first? You go out, right? <laughs> you go into the, to the residential unit, and then, then you try to go out again to the balcony, or terrace, and garden. So that's a natural thing. You are not, you are not meant to live in buildings. Yeah? So, so buildings are just maybe needed, but, 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 but we should do as, as a minimum. Uh, good evening, and thanks for a splendid talk. Uh, I've been admiring your work since you published the book on your bank some dozen years ago or more, 
And uh, I, I think the, the quality of the detailing in that was something I just was astounded by relative to what I was seeing in my own experience in my own uh, in neighborhood. And uh, I've worked enough with clients to know that it's tough to get those kind of things done. And I was wondering if maybe you'd address how, how the process was to bring a client like that along so that they would spend that much money and that much time on those really refined details. So much money. It, it depends. I mean, the RWE building is for sure an expensive building, was, was an expensive building. Uh, but still, I mean, there were 200 people or 300 people working in that building. It's one of the biggest German companies. I don't think it was a real problem for them to spend the money on that. Um, there are other buildings like the O2 building in Munich, which is a reasonable, normal building, a normal building budget. And that is for most of our buildings the case. Uh, I, think, I think it's not an excuse to say it's difficult to get that from the client. And it's not just a fight with the client. Um, we normally don't, don't fight with the client. <laughs> um, it's more, I think you have to take care. I mean, you have to have a commitment about that. And that is a, it's a kind of intensity of work you have to do. Um, my impression is that in, 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 in some um, archi even architectural organizations and studios, uh, the amount of work that goes into marketing and, and, and acquisition and, and, I don't know, economics is maybe too big. Yeah? And you have to, to, to concentrate a little bit more about construction and, 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 and delivering beautiful and, and good detailed architecture. Uh, I don't think it's a mirror. It's, it's not a miracle, right? It's, you can't do that. So it's uh, doable. I, find, I always find the impression that it's just about money. You know, it's not, not just about money. <laughs> Hi. The last time we met, actually, I was looking at the RWE building, so it was a long time ago. I'm James <laughs> Russell. But uh, I'm seeing a lot of moving away from the double facades, that uh, people regard them as too expensive, too intensive use of resources to make the double wall. And some people argue to me that the glass walls are simply, you know, all glass walls are simply can't be made sufficiently uh, efficient for what we have to be. Curious what you have to say. Yeah, this is an ongoing debate. Um, and, and I would avoid that ideological aspect in it, which is, has to do with glass or stone, with closed close facade, with cut out windows, or with full transparency. I, I, think, I think it's a little bit of uh, window talking, cause, because if you, if you look to one life, for example, actually 50% of the building has a double skin, the rest is a normal facade. Um, if you look to the RWE, okay, 100% double skin. If you look to our whole agenda, you will see at least as much building with a single facade as a double facade. Uh, and, and before I die, I will build a stone building, I promise. <laughs> Because, because it's not about that. I mean, it's definitely not about that. If, if, if the conditions and if, the, if it makes sense to build a building with smaller windows, let's do it. Yeah? It's, it's about uh, what makes sense in that, uh, in that respect. And you can't, for, I, I, I really think it makes no sense to build in the city center of Sydney building with, with small windows. Because the people like that view and, and, and you have to respect that vision in a way. And, and, and so you do that. But if it is in the middle of New York in a, in a mid-rise building and the neighbor is whatever, 20 meters away or 25 meters away, maybe there's a sense for, uh, for building a building with just 50% glass or 30% or glass or 20% glass even. But you know, you can, you can put that a little bit down, but if you get too much into a closed um, uh, uh, environment, the problem is then that you have too less daylight, too less ventilation and so on. So there's a, there's a way in between, and we see that with 60 to 40, 40 to 60 somewhere, um, that, that makes sense. And there are, even in Germany, even stricter rules now for, for isolation. So normally, without a double skin, you have to go for some 40 to 60 uh, close to transparency. A 100% uh, glass building would be not allowed anymore if it is not a double skin. I have a follow-up question about what makes sense in, in your phrase. Um, since you're using percentages better than, and you mentioned the first double, double skin, 
Um, who's deciding what makes sense? Uh, you, you, you mentioned your own innovation for energy efficiency. You mentioned six-star um, government ratings or you know official professional mm. ratings. Um, makes sense uh, is a subject uh, in terms of windows is a and views is a subjective characterization. So how how do you evaluate and what do you think in a broader sense? drives either innovation, regulation, or you know, good sustainable practice. Singapore is a very different place than, um, than Sydney, that is a very different place certainly than Germany. Mm. Um, I think the driver are the people. Um, I, I think uh, there is an ongoing debate about is LEED the right system or is it a German one in Germany, for example, and I would say LEED is better because LEED has a better marketing and if the end user drives the people, drives the, drives the architects, drives the developers uh, to green buildings, that's very good uh, because the end user is the main factor in that. Um, and my experience is that the user of the building are most concerned about the health of the people and, and, and the, the well, well-being of the people inside the building. So that is a driving force for me. And then there are regulations, like, like, like uh, cities like Singapore, for example, are quite keen with regulations. They do a lot of, uh, uh, they support us a lot in that green thinking. Uh, Sydney supported us by that extra GFA. So that drives it as well. And then it is commitment. Uh, uh, if, if, if architects today or engineers are not committed with green building, they do something wrong, I think, because it's obvious that we have to do something. Uh, uh, if overpopulation is as I showed you today, and as you know, um, and, and, if, uh, and if you build buildings like, like, like in the 60s uh, in, to, to, to cover that need, that will be a disaster in energy terms and resource terms, so, so we have to change something. Um, that's, that's it, right? <laughs> I have a very mundane question that deals with your building in Sydney. You have two layers of glass, you have blinds in between the two. How often do they have to be washed? Mm. You have out exterior air coming in, right? Does Sydney have a pollution problem? And how, is, how are the, all these panes of glass washed and how often? I would, I would think we, we uh, I, d I don't know exactly what it is in S Sydney, but I know that for this, for the Lufthansa building in Frankfurt, which where, where the pollution is more serious, I think they do it three to four times a year, and that's reasonable, I think. Yeah. You have to, you have to see a flat facade like that is quite practical, cleanable. Um, and then if you have a double skin, you can step inside and clean it. At least you can clean it. It's not outside and, and, and you, it's reachable. I think it's a good, there's a good news about that. Glass is qu quite sustainable as well. Uh, can last for 50 years or something. And, and you know, if you look to the maintenance p point of view, I would like to ask the people in the Rockefeller Center, which is a stone building mainly, right, uh, what the what the proper maintenance costs them a year. I think, I think there is a lot of uh, talking about glass and stone buildings. Uh, every owner of a building knows that he has to put some money in maintenance, uh, otherwise uh, the, the building does look awful within two or three years, right? I think both of your buildings uh, with atriums are, are sealed, uh, have a glassed over ceiling. And I wondered if you had any thought of having it an open atrium to the sky, similar to Stephen Hall's Beijing project, which is interconnected buildings with sky rails, but it's all open on the inside. You, 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 mean, op you mean the Singapore project now in, compar uh, in, in comparison to the, the Stephen Hall building? or? Mm -hmm. Because uh, the the uh, one Bly has a closed atrium in 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 terms of having a canopy, a glass canopy on top, just to make sure that there is no rain falling into it. But uh, if you if you know the the, the Sydney climber, um, it's quite a comfortable place. We don't have any. I mean, 
the, 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 the glass is quite open. Uh, we don't have any close connection between the profiles and the glass. It's all ventilated through, through the whole year. So it's not really closed. Yeah? It's closed in terms of rain, but it's not closed in terms of, of, of air. Christoph, from the, from the standpoint of uh, sustainability, which doesn't necessarily equate to the, uh, the building rating systems, no. but from, from the standpoint of true sustainability, uh, do you think that tall buildings, skyscrapers, can be uh, net zero buildings or carbon neutral buildings? And secondly, do you think they need to be? Uh, I think they need to be uh, at least getting near to it, um, and and uh, I, I I can say yes, they can, they can. Why not? Um, there is an additional amount of energy you're using for transportation infrastructure, getting the loads uh, up in the in the higher f uh, upper floors and things like that. But away from the, apart from that, um, it's a normal building, right? You, you can you can do that. I, I think you can do that. We have to. Um, we did an interesting thing for, for Google. I mean, if, you, if you're talking about sustainability and you're talking about, um, and you're talking about uh, rating systems, for example, the reason why I mentioned the rating is more or less that it's a quite, quite objective kind of rating. Yeah? You can, I mean, you can't really cheat heavily. Um, to be honest, yes, it does not say that the building is as good as it is supposed to be, maybe. Okay, but, but still, it's a, it's a matter of fact uh, that the rating systems has helped us, us to, to, to develop the quality of the sustainability, uh, economical and, and uh, ecological thinking in, in, the, in the building industry. So, so this is that. But for Google, we try to go far beyond that, and, and we try to, to, to find out what is, what, is what is sustainability, what is it? What, 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 are, what are we aiming for? There is from the World Wildlife Fund, they're doing every second year um, a calculation on what they call um, the footprint calculation. They're, they are calculating different regions in the world um, uh, and, and, they, and they're trying to find out what is their ecological capacity and what is the footprint. Um, for, I'll give you an example. The U.S. Um, have uh, uh, using four times uh, the capacity they have. Uh, Germany is 2.7, even not very good. Uh, so Saudi Arabia is 10. They are using 10 times the capacity that the land has. Um, so we try to find out what not, Northern California has for capacity. Um, we, 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 we try to calculate how, man, how, how, how big the percentage is that you can spend in the company because you spend something at home in holidays and so on. And then we try to convince Google about that, that we just use what we deserve. What piece of the cake is ours? If, you, if, you, if you're going for whatever five or 4,000 people, employees in, 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 in a building, um, can you then calculate what you deserve? Because if you're talking about net zero, it does mean that you deserve nothing, zero. But, but you have something, there's a capacity, you can use that capacity, it's not zero. So I, I try to avoid that word zero in that respect. I, I say it is a matter of what, what is your um, proportional piece of the cake that you deserve. And, but you shouldn't eat more. And, and, and it might be difficult to find out what you deserve, but, but, I, but I think it's possible and you, just, you should try uh, getting there. And, and, and I think that is, that is the way. I mean, uh, uh, you, can, you can use something. Uh, there is oil, uh, even if it's get, getting less. There is uh, biofuel, there is uh, whatever, water, there's geothermal. Um, if you look to geothermal, many people think that that is endlessly available. That's not true. Because um, if, you, if you use it, you might uh, as well, I mean, you invest money and energy into it, uh, in the production and in the, in the exploration. But, uh, um, but apart from that, you're heating the earth. 
in a way. And that can significantly influence uh, the temperature of water or, or, or soil um, near to the, to, to the building. So it's not endless. Uh, also there you have to ask yourself, what is your portion of the cake? Yeah. Difficult discussion, I think. I, um, I wonder with respect to natural ventilation if, um, if there are ways and if you, if you modulate the opening and closing of windows or if you use other kinds of openings, automated openings, in order to, to optimize the, the natural ventilation seasonally and, and by time of day. I didn't get that really. I mean... How do you keep people yeah. from opening the windows willy-nilly and yeah. robbing you of the benefit of natural uh, ventilation? Yeah. Yeah. And are there other kinds of openings aside from windows that can be controlled more, more optimally? Yeah, I, I didn't bring the, the photos. We, we have uh, done a building for Swarovski on the Lake Zurich where we didn't have any, we, we have a double skin, but no, no, let's say, we, we have a double skin there, but no normal windows. Uh, because of the view. We wanted to protect the view, have no window profiles. And so we came out with the idea of, of having just louvers uh, on, on the front of the, of the, of the, of the, of the slab. Um, so we are using just a 30, 35 centimeter of the floor slab. And in front of that, we have some louvers. And we control them by a mechanically driven uh, louver system. Uh, that's possible. Why not? I mean, if you look to the Sydney project, for example, to avoid that overheating, we, 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 we separate every, store, uh, every level from each other. We make sure that the air is getting out. We have a blade running 50 centimeters out of the facade to make sure that it is a mixture with, 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 with the outside air um, so that overheating is avoided, which is the biggest problem in a double skin facade. If you have an outside temperature of 30 degree and you have a cavity temperature of 40 something, that is a catastrophic thing. If you, if you want to use the air for, for ventilation, yes, for sure, we optimize that. Uh, we have to wrap up in a minute, but um, if I might ask you a question about the we that you talk about. Within the office, are, do you have engineers, uh, mechanical MEP engineers, or are you all architects and you work with consultants? How do you, how do you collaborate and innovate in the, in the uh, realm of engineering in, solutions? Yeah, in Germany, the engineering so um, uh, society or the, 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 uh, the community of engineering companies is much smaller. Um, the, 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 the average size of engineering companies is whatever, five to six to 10 to 20 people. Um, but it is a very specialized world. Um, so funny or not, uh, around Stuttgart, there is a whole bunch of uh, very, very good companies like Transola or DS Plan or Sobek and so on. And we use them since whatever, since 25 years uh, in a close collaboration. Uh, we are doing more than the half of our projects as general, what we call general planner, which is um, uh, integrating all the engineers' contracts into our contract. Um, and we are, uh, people like that are normally expected to do that on economical terms, like, like, like shrinking uh, engineers' fees and so on. We are not doing that. We have worked, I think, really with the world's best engineers. On a, on a sufficient and, and long-lasting basis. Um, and that kind of friendship and, and, and team that we have for the last 25 years make it possible to do so. Um, as architects, you know that controlling a, a structural engineer is difficult enough. Controlling a, me a, a, controlling a mechanical engineer is impossible. <laughs> uh, so the problems are coming from there, uh, always. <laughs> Fire protection and, and mechanical. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but still, I mean, we have very friendly people there helping us. And, and then we have, um, since 15 years, roughly, two mechanical engineers in the company uh, just to get our own idea about what is happening on that, on that side. I think we need to wrap it up for the evening because we are at the end. Maybe um, the last questions can be taken individually. But we thank you all for coming. And thanks so much for Christoph and Architects Newspaper and Enclose for uh, bringing him to the conference. And I know some of you will be seeing him and hearing him tomorrow as well. So it was a delight for us all to uh, find out why he loves skyscrapers. Thank you. Thank you.
A hundred years ago was the opening um, of the Woolworth Building, the big ceremony when in Washington, uh, President Woodrow Wilson pressed a button and the dynamos in the basement of the Woolworth Building fired up and 80,000 incandescent lights flared on in all of the floors of the 55-story tower, as well as the beacon at the top that could be seen out for uh, dozens of miles to see. So, uh, so skyscraper history in New York is extremely rich, uh, and we have exported the skyscraper in architecture and engineering to many other parts of the world. And one of the rationales for this lecture series, that uh, this is the second in a series called What's Up, is the what's up around the world. What's up uh, in, 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 in interesting, innovative, architecture and engineering design um, so that we can begin to explore and invite uh, speakers from other parts to, to, inf to one would hope, uh, inform some of the ideas and yet to, f to find um, relationships between global cities uh, like New York and all of these other places. Part of this is because I, um, I'm in the introduction to Christoph in a moment, I want to talk about um, one Bly Street, Sydney, and the, the um, exceptional design of that building and the relationship between these harbor cities. Uh, but just so that you know a little bit more about the museum and it, Mick here or not yet? No? Okay. Um, uh, so, um, so you know a little bit about the museum. We are devoted to the idea of exploring in depth the history of New York and the skyscraper and the high rise, not just in its pure height, but in the horizontal professions that come together in order to, um, to bring these extraordinarily complicated machines into being. So development, design, engineering, construction, operation, occupation. And um, so I hope you'll come and see the, the Woolworth Show because it really does try to integrate these many aspects of the design experience. Um, that relates, I think, and I'm going to introduce uh, Christoph now, and then um, I'll introduce uh, Mick and, and thank him for, and Diana Darling and the Architects newspaper for, um, for sharing Christoph on his visit uh, to New York because some of you are here for the facades conference that they're running and will be on, uh, on Thursday and Friday. Uh, but we were able to, to grab uh, Christoph for an evening where he just celebrates uh, the tall building, as you can see, <laughs> he picked the title Why I Love Skyscrapers as a, as a defense of this high-rise building type. So um, I first uh, encountered Christoph's work uh, in, in the flesh uh, in Sydney, and this, this extraordinary building that you're seeing here and you will see tonight in depth, One Bly Street, Sydney. Um, I think, I'll put my cards on the table, I think this building is really a masterpiece. And a masterpiece is a, is a, uh, a work of art that has so many layers of intelligence that you can keep unfolding and peeling away. Um, and, and this building, which um, is not a skyscraper in the sense that it's, it doesn't have a silhouette against the sky, it's not a, a romantic pointing to the heavens kind of um, Empire State Building iconic image. It's, a, it's a, a, a building which is embedded in the city in a very constricted site um, in Sydney where everything is about views, everything is about harbor views, and all the value of, of buildings come from increasing the look out um, and not, not so much standing out against the, um, the context. And so when I um, saw this building on the, actually the first day that it had opened because I had been invited to Sydney to give uh, a lecture at the university there, um, I was taken around by some, uh, some architects from, from the school uh, and we sat down, we climbed up the stairs and we had a wonderful cappuccino at this bar that had just opened inside of the courtyard of the building. And, and the, the building was um, just overwhelmingly beautiful, but it was more than beautiful. It was intelligent, it was engineered, it was green, and as you'll hear from Christoph tonight, sustainability is one of the basic underpinnings of his idea ideas about marrying engineering and architecture. Um, but the part about the building, and this is the part that so influenced um, 
my appreciation of it when I was on the jury for the Deutsche Architecture Museum Awards, High Rise Awards, with which one Bly Street won um, this last year in, in 2012. Uh, it also won the Council on Tall Buildings, Urban Habitat, best uh, building in Asia and Australia because they divide up the world into continents and areas. Um, it's, a, it's a building which I think is not that well known in New York yet, and so we're very happy to introduce it tonight. Um, but when I was on the, the jury and we were looking at this, this, these buildings that were um, comparing um, themselves to um, other um, world's tallest towers, the, the idea that height was the most important thing about a building was, was easily um, put aside. And the thing that impressed me the most in, um, about the building, and I had the opportunity to talk about this um, when I gave the laudatio at the, at the ceremonies in, um, uh, in Frankfurt last year, last, last November, when Christoph received the, the award, um, the, was, was the extraordinary place-making character, the public realm aspect of, the, of this building. And um, so I, I know, because I've had a peek at his uh, slide set um, that you're going to see this evening, that he's, he is going to uh, unpeel the layers to, to show you the, the rationale and the logic of this design, um, as well as his, his many other um, exceptional projects. So um, Christoph Ingenhoven was, was born in Dusseldorf, where he still does practice. He studied at the Rhine and Westphalia um, Technological University in Aachen. He also studied with Hans Holhein at the Academy of Arts in Dusseldorf um, for two years. And uh, in 1985, he founded the, the firm which carries his name, Ingenhoven Architects. They're a um, reasonably small firm, or a good-sized firm of about 70 employees, and they now are, uh, they have done many important works um, throughout Germany and, and Europe, um, including the Lufthansa headquarters in the Frankfurt Airport, an extraordinarily um, beautiful, modernist, engineered uh, building, uh, but increasingly are doing work around the world, including this one Bly Street uh, in Sydney, and a very large and spectacular project that he'll show us tonight in, uh, in Singapore called Marina One. So, Diana, are we ready to go? We are? Yes. So, Mick Patterson from Enclose is going to also um, welcome, especially those of you who are participating in the conference tomorrow. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So, I'm, along with the rest of you, really looking forward to this talk because I love skyscrapers. And I love the Skyscraper Museum. And if you haven't been there, you should all go and check it out. Uh, I, I have been impressed for a long time uh, with Christoph Ingenhofen. I saw him first speak at um, one of the McGraw-Hill Innovation Conferences downtown where, or I should say uptown, midtown, where we're having uh, our Facades Plus conference tomorrow. Uh, and I was deeply impressed. There was this dialogue going on uh, on one side. The, the, the presenters just before him were a, a council from uh, a, a, a panel from the Tall Building Council, uh, and they pretty much came to the conclusion during their talk that the only way to achieve sustainability in the built environment was uh, to uh, prescriptively limit the amount of glass in the building facade, and then. Christoph Ingenhoven got up right after them and showed the kind of work that you're going to see tonight. It was like point counterpoint, and it was just awesome. This dialogue still debates. Uh, this, this, I'm sorry. This debate still continues. Uh, in fact, um, it rages uh, to some extent, and I think that uh, that will be in evidence at the um, symposium that we are uh, holding tomorrow. Facades Plus Symposium. Christoph is the keynote speaker. I hope all of you can make it. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, there's going to be a lot, large group of people. We have a tremendous lineup of speakers. Uh, and we have a full day of very compelling workshops uh, following on Friday. Um, this is an ongoing series of conferences. Uh, I hope that you'll participate in the dialogue that we are building around the building facade. And this is one of the things that I think is so remarkable about Christoph. Uh, not only is, a, is he a great architect, but he is a master with the building facade. And this is such a, an important element of, of architecture. I mean, what is there in architecture that combines both considerations of performance and appearance, as does the building skin? So uh, 
Christoph is. Christoph, are you here? So, welcome, Christoph. 